Hello everybody, my name is Mai Win and I'm a PhD student at the University of Pavia in Italy and a member of the VPHI student committee. I'm very pleased to welcome you to this VPHI keynote webinar, which is endorsed and co-organized by the European Society for Biomechanics. So our speaker today is uh, Paul McLean, Associate Professor and Director of Undergraduate Studies in the Department of Intelligence System Engineering at Indiana University. Uh, today, his presentation is an overview of his current work, High Throughput Multicellular Simulation Studies with the PhysiCell, which is an open source platform developed by his lab. So, Paul, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, and thank you everyone for, for calling in here today. Really appreciate your taking the time here on a Friday afternoon. Uh, it's a Friday morning for me, yes. Um, thank you for the invitation. I really appreciate it. Um, so we're going to talk about high throughput uh, multicellular simulations that we're doing with our open source platform called PhysiCell. Uh, I want to start off by just uh, thanking uh, all the partners we've had the great fortune of working with over the last few years. This is actually uh, an incomplete list now, um, including both uh, biologists like uh, Stacey Finley and Shannon Momenthaler at USC and modelers like Stacey Finley, uh, wonderful collaborators at Johns Hopkins University like Daniel Gilks working in hypoxia and Andy Ewald working in uh, breast cancer organoids. And, and then just a wonderful group of uh, technical collaborators like Andrew Randy Highland, who's the main research associate in my lab, uh, undergraduate and graduate students here at Indiana University, and, and just a wonderful community of collaborators in high performance computing at Argonne National Lab, the University of Delaware, and Barcelona Supercomputing Center, among other places. And work like this would not be possible uh, without wonderful collaborators. And we're also very grateful for some funding from the National Institutes of Health, the National Science Foundation, the Breast Cancer Research Foundation and the Jane Koskina's Ted Jude Bonas Foundation for Health and Policy. So we are incredibly grateful for that and we want to put that uh, right up front and center. And to kind of give us some overview here, uh, cancer is a systems problem. Uh, you can't attack cancer and diseases like cancer by just understanding cancer cells in isolation. Uh, it's a multi-scale, multi-physics problem. You have individual cells that have their own individual behaviors uh, they go through their own signaling processes. They have molecular scale things like signaling and uh, protein regulation, synthesis and degradation processes, uh, cytoskeletal remodeling. Then at the cell scale, you have uh, individual cell behaviors, but they don't act in, in isolation. They communicate with one another chemically and mechanically. They can push on each other. They can sense that. They can secrete chemical signals and, and sense those, and they can follow chemical gradients. Uh, then, of course, they, they live in a physical environment, so they're subject to physics in the post constraints, things like diffusion limits of growth factors, uh, physical barriers. Uh, if they are motile, they need something to grab onto for, uh, for traction. And then, of course, in this body, you have systems of systems, things like the immune system that bundle up systems of different cells that organize and interact and go through differentiation networks. And so the human body is this system of system of systems. And when it works well, which is kind of a miracle, we work. And when these parts fall into, mis into misbalance, uh, we get diseases. Uh, so cancer is a particular example of that. When the cells start ignoring system, uh, regulations and checks on growth and, uh, and kind of stop behaving as good members of the community. And uh, treatments traditionally have been very reductionist and have targeted parts of these systems target an oncogene, target a tumor suppressor gene, target a growth pathway, kill tumor cells as fast as possible, shut down blood vessels. Um, but these tend to not be as successful as we'd like because when you muck with a complex system and only muck with a small part of it without regard to that broader system, you have uh, unexpected surprising effects that percolate through your system and uh, that leads to treatment failure or side effects or, or other problems. So simulation and modeling is one way we can take a look and try to understand cancer as a system rather than as the individual parts. And to the extent that we can study it, this is the field of multicellular systems biology. And uh, to the extent that we hope to control these systems, not just understand, but control them, now we've entered the realm of multicellular systems engineering, to engineer the behavior of those systems. Um, that's, of course, the goal of a physician, is to control the system. And so scientists use models to detangle complex systems like cancer 
like disease, like tissue engineering. And there are a variety of animal you know, model systems out there, ranging from animal models, uh, in vitro models, model layer cultures, engineered models like organoids or bioprinted tissues. And now in this case, we're gonna show you mathematical and computational model systems that we want to use as a virtual laboratory to detangle these complex systems. And so what would be the key parts of a multicellular laboratory, a virtual laboratory? Well, first, uh, the chemical environment is very important. So you need to model the diffusion and movement of different chemical factors. Not just one thing or two things like oxygen or glucose, but five or 10 or 20. Oxygen, glucose, other metabolites, waste products, signaling factors, uh, one or more therapeutics you might have introduced into the system. Very soon, you're modeling five or 10 diffusion equations in 3D. Within that chemical environment, cells need to be able to move around and track their individual states. Um, each cell might have its own uh, logic or molecular scale behavioral uh, patterns based upon sampling the microenvironment and their communication through chemical and physical means. They mechanically interact with other cells, they stick, they push each other around, they're motile. And the fact that uh, in many diseases, heterogeneity is very important, that each individual cell can have its own type, its own state, its own parameter values, its own model rules, and those could be changing over the course of time. So you need a simulation framework that can account for this kind of uh, dynamicism in an actual multicellular system. And then you need to be able to not just run one copy of the model, but realize that these are stochastic models modeling stochastic processes. And one model instance is not enough. You need to be able to run many, many copies of model and high throughput to discover uh, the rules that best match your observations, to fully explore the, the space of hypotheses or the space of model design and to identify and exploit the weaknesses that you could use to possibly restore control to the underlying biological system. And so these are the components we're gonna talk about today in building a virtual laboratory. So let me give you kind of the brief overview of our simulation toolbox. Uh, the first part is called BioFBM, it stands for a finite volume method for biology. This is a system that we designed to simulate many diffusion equations simultaneously in 3D. And because we knew that we um, don't want to just settle for one big simulation, but many, many copies of medium-sized simulations, we worked very hard to get this to work on a single compute node or on a desktop. Uh, it's second order accurate in space, first order accurate in time. It's cross-platform compatible, which means that you can take uh, Center C++ 11 and run this thing on Windows, Linux, OS X, uh, pretty much any platform we've encountered with the standard C++, we've been able to successfully compile and run this, this code. The uh, computational scaling runs linearly the number of uh, substrates or the number of diffusion equations, linearly in the number of voxels or the domain size. And so we found that we can easily simulate five to 10 diffusion equations on about a million voxels. Uh, that's enough for about eight to 10 cubic millimeters of tissue on just a standard desktop uh, workstation or on a single compute node. And critically, the, the way we wrote this is um, the computational cost scales linearly with the number of diffusion equations, but the slope is less than one, which means that to go from one diffusion equation to two diffusion equations does not double your cost, it just increases it a little. We found that uh, 10 diffusion equations is only about two to three times the amount of work of just simulating one diffusion equation. And so that makes this thing tractable. So this is cross-platform, open source, available in bioinformatics. So that's the chemical microenvironment. Uh, I'm going to wait for this little progress bar to load. Um, <clears throat> so uh, on top of this, we built something called physics cell. This is a physics-based multicellular simulator. Our goal here was to simulate, uh, you know, on the order of hundreds of thousands to millions of cells in 2D or 3D on a single desktop workstation or on an HPC node. And so this takes BioFBM, that that uh, computational framework uh, for diffusion. And on top of it adds agents that can move around. They have an off lattice position. They all have individual states that can be changed directly at runtime. Each cell can have uh, independent uh, parameters added to it. Uh, on top of this, we tried to model uh, typical cell processes like cycle progression, uh, mechanics, motility, secretion and, uh, and uptake of chemical factors. Uh, each cell can have custom functions attached to it as function pointers, which means that you can dynamically 
uh, change the behavior of any individual agent at any time of the simulation. So it's a very uh, flexible platform. Uh, we tested it very extensively. It's OpenMP parallelized. Uh, it runs cross-platform as well, Windows, OS X, Linux, uh, pretty much anything under the sun. And we've run it on hardware ranging all the way from Raspberry Pis to uh, Cray uh, compute clusters. So we've had a lot of uh, success with this. In the simulation you see here, each of these dots is an individual cell growing under uh, diffusion limits. So yellow cells are more responsive to oxygen, which is diffusing from the outside. Blue cells less responsive, so yellow cells do proliferate a little faster. And then due to oxygen transport limits, you get the emergence of a necrotic core in the center of the tumor. That's this brown stuff. Now, because of the mechanics in the simulation, necrotic cells are shrinking, but they're still adherent. And this is a mechanically unstable process. And you see what emerges is this network of chasms or openings uh, inside the necrotic core. And that's something we have seen in organoid experiments so far, this is the only simulation framework that has replicated this mechanical effect because we are working with off-lattice mechanics coupled with the diffusion of their effects, uh, the physical constraints of the environment. And so here you can see uh, a simulation going up to about 10 of the six cells. And each of these dots is a cell nucleus. You can track the movement of each one. And one thing I find informative in watching a simulation like this is watching the, the overall flux of the cells by tracking their nuclei. You can see that some cells are proliferating outward, as you expect, but many more cells are also being flexed or pushed into the necrotic core just because of the mechanics of the problem. So uh, this was published in PLOS Computational Biology a few years ago. The cost scaling is linear in the number of cells. So if you double the number of cells, you double the amount of work. You don't multiply it by a factor of four. And we were very grateful that this uh, won the PLOS Computational Biology uh, Research Prize for Public Impact last year. So uh, we're very excited about this work. So you put those together and you have the chemical environment and you have the, uh, <coughs> the cells moving around the environment. And now you'd like to be able to customize and add uh, multi-scale effects. So one thing you can do is you can add uh, extra mathematics to each individual cell. So as a simple example, give each cell uh, parameters for uh, aerobic respiration, glycolytic uh, energy production, uh, production and, and tolerance to salt, and give them all their own, I'm sorry, waste products, uh, give them all their individual parameter values, and then you add on top of the model, uh, tracking oxygen glucose uptake and energy production, and then you make birth and death an energy dependent process. Um, and so if you take, put that into a simulation, you can track the individual properties of each cell and really see the heterogeneity as uh, really selection processes start shaking out. And even after a week, the landscape has really not settled down yet. Uh, after um, a month, you start seeing clonal patches in your tumor, and you start seeing a more familiar, more energy on the outside edge of the tumor, less on the in core. And then really after a month and a half, you start seeing the more uh, expected processes of selection. So here's just an example of using business cell to really track through a heterogeneous uh, process and give individual properties on a cell-by-cell -cell basis. And this is something that you can do uh, in, in lots of applications. So I'd like to spend really the, the next part of the talk going through just a few detailed examples of sample problems that we've applied to this cell, primarily to cancer, but other examples as well. And then how we've ramped up these, uh, these examples to be a little bit more efficient and a little bit higher impact by using high throughput, and high performance computing and machine learning. So uh, let's see here. So the first example, we're gonna work on the impact of hypoxia or low, low oxygen on cancer cell invasion. And this is work with Daniel Gilks at Johns Hopkins University, one of our wonderful collaborators. <coughs> so first of all, in many cancers, including breast cancer, uh, the tumors get hypoxic. Normal breast tissue has oxygen at about 65 millimeters of partial pressure, but in hypoxic tumors, um, you really get the mean oxygen levels much lower, around 10 millimeters of partial pressure. And at that level, uh, hypoxia-inducible factors, or HIFs, start accumulating the cell and leading and triggering uh, hypoxic changes, phenotypic changes or behavioral changes on cancer cells. In particular, uh, they start acting a little bit more stem-like. They increase the motility. They start migrating to try to escape hypoxic regions. Uh, there tends to be increased extracellular matrix remodeling, so they change the mechanics of the tissue around them. They tend to change their metabolism by uh, metabolizing more glucose and increasing more acid. 
uh, as a byproduct and becoming more tolerant to those acidic conditions. Uh, in some cases, they might decrease their cell cell adhesion and they might increase their secretion of vascular endothelial growth factor, or VEGF, which helps to prompt the creation of loop blood vessels around them. So just here's an example of a hypoxic tumor from a mouse model. Uh, and these, this brown staining around here is staining for hypoxic tissue regions. So you can see that it can be quite extensive and then a big dead necrotic cord in the center of the tumor. And if you were to sample this thing with an optical probe, you can see how the oxygen really drops from quite high outside the tumor to just about non-existence as you get into the tumor interior. So hypoxic gradients are really an important driving factor here. And Dr. Geltz has created a novel hypoxic reporter. She engineered the cells so that when they start off, they all fluoresce red fluorescent protein. But after they've been exposed to hypoxic conditions, they do a permanent gene change on themselves and stop secreting red. They cut the gene out altogether and start secreting a, a green fluorescent protein. So you can track who has been hypoxic and where they've gone. Uh, and this is recently published in uh, Nature, uh, Nature Communications. And these slides will be available later where you can click all these hyperlinks and download all of these wonderful references. And so uh, we have a number of observations uh, to, 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 to look at and to help drive the modeling and drive our scientific questions. First of all, observational data, which is, I think, the most valuable data we can get as modelers. Uh, Danielle found that both green and red cells, so both hypoxic and non-hypoxic cells, are capable of, of forming metastases in the lung and forming these uh, far-off growths. So both populations can leave the tumor cell, uh, the primary tumor. However, she also found that green cells are the first ones to form hypo. Uh, uh, first of all, green cells are the first to observe the perinecrotic boundary, kind of the low oxygen, you know, nearly dead zone of the tumor. Uh, the green cells are later found at the outer edge of the tumor, so they're able to somehow get out of the tumor. So we think that must be cell motility. Um, I also found that uh, the hypoxia is not dramatically changing the cell proliferation characteristics for these cells uh, if they're in similar conditions. So they can retain their, their proliferation pretty well. Uh, we also see necrotic cores. Uh, the other thing we find is that the metastases is not in the, the data here, but metastases in the lung are either all red or all green. So it suggests that once they arrive, they form microcolonies and grow out. They're not just mixing and matching in the distant sites. So we know they can, uh, so there are some questions here. Are red cells ever motile? Are all green cells always motile or just some, and, uh, or just some of them? Uh, how long do we keep this motile phenotype? Uh, just when they're low oxygen, for a short time after leaving low oxygen conditions, or permanently? And how much coordination is there between the red and the green cells? So this is some fundamental questions that we're starting to ask based upon the data and the models. <coughs> so really, right now, let's zero in on what are the rules for hypoxic cell motility? And how long or how persistent is this response to hypoxic stress? So the first model that we examined says that uh, red cells become green in low, in low oxygen conditions, and that once they're uh, in low hypoxic conditions, uh, they can become motile and follow oxygen gradients to escape the tumor, the hypoxic zones of the tumor. But once they leave hypoxic conditions, they immediately stop at being motile. And so this is the case of no phenotypic persistence. Once they leave hypoxic stress, they do not persist in that, that response. And in simulation models, we found that the, the hypoxic cells more or less just keep escaping the hypoxic zone and then hovering around the edge of the non-hypoxic tumor. And the whole tumor keeps growing out. And so that boundary keeps running away from them and no hypoxic cells ever escape the tumor. This doesn't match our observations. We get a necrotic core, but we never have hypoxic cells or the green cells that reach the edge of the tumor. And they never form just metastases because they can't even escape the primary. So this hypothesis doesn't seem to work. We need something a little different. So now we just changed the model a little bit. And we've got a hypoxic, uh, per now a phenotypic permanence. So now when a green cell becomes motile, it's always motile. Um, we keep the same division rate, but they're always motile. And in this case, we see now that the tumor cells, the green cells successfully tunnel their way through and escape the tumor. Uh, so that matches observations. However, uh, none of them are sticking around to form a necrotic core. We just have this big empty space in the center. And none of these green cells are forming microcolonies. They are forming not 
distinct growths, they are escaping and spreading and multiplying. So it's kind of a mess. And that doesn't match our observations either. But even this model improvement has given us some new things and some new insights into the underlying biology. Uh, if you zoom into the, the microarchitecture of these green invasions, you see these, what we're calling hypoxic plumes, these kind of these clouds that are growing to the red normoxic zones. And it looks a lot like collective migration. And in fact, if you were a biologist just looking at a still frame, you'd say, aha, look, green cells that are moving, they're together, that's collective migration. But the model tells us that's not the case here. These green cells are all acting purely independently. There's no communication whatsoever. So you can get what looks like collective migration purely through mechanics and purely through individual motion. What's happening is that this thing is stochastic. Some green cells finding a little mechanical weakness in the tissue and pushing through, which opens up a gap, then other motile cells can preferentially migrate through the mechanical weaknesses. And so uh, that's an interesting thing. The other interesting thing is that these shapes are observed in the experimental systems. So if you zoom in, you can see a green hypoxic plume in the experimental system uh, that looks very similar to the green hypoxic plume emerging in the simulation. This gives us more faith in the simulations. Nelson's an interesting point where a simulation was able to predict independently an emergent structure based on very simple assumptions, uh, and it was able to be borne out in these experiments. The other uh, neat in, uh, message here is that engineering and simulations can really go hand in hand in driving just biological discovery. The novel imaging, the novel hypoxic marker from the engineering was able to reveal a hidden structure we'd never seen before, these green hypoxic plumes. And then computational modeling was able to give us a plausible explanation to understand and explain the new structure we hadn't seen before. And these two things go hand in hand to drive experimental uh, and biological discovery. Now let's add one more thing. Instead of phenotypic permanence, let's add phenotypic persistence. So now, if a green cell leaves a hypoxic zone, it keeps that phenotype for some kind of a fixed persistence time. Now, if you add these together, now the tumor cells escape and then stop and form little microcolonies, which is close to what we see in, in organoid models and in experimental models. Uh, the thing that we still are missing is the necrotic core. And so this, this suggests this future work is that not all the cells are responding to the hypoxic, but some small subpopulation. And if you get that, then we'll probably get the, the coherent narcotic cores. So there's one detailed example of combining experimental observations with the computational model system to help us really understand a complex biological system. Moving on to a second model system, uh, a second example, I'd like to look at synthetic multicellular systems. And so kind of uh, imagine kind of the science fiction of engineering a tissue or some other multicellular system. Uh, cells have a handful of phenotypic programs, and suppose that we can control them and turn them on or off. Turn chemotaxis on or off. Uh, turn adhesion on or off. Turn secretion of a growth factor on or off. Uh, switch between random and directed migration. Well, what would happen if we kind of had this palette of design motifs, and we could turn them on or off? What could we get away with? In particular, what if we didn't limit our logic to just one engineered cell type but a collection of engineered cell types. We had a multicellular logic. Could we design something useful? And so in that test case, we said, could we take simple, biologically plausible rules and create a cargo delivery system where some cells are cargo, some cells are delivery bots, and some cells help us direct the, the delivery bots to deliver your cargo where they need to go. And so the idea is to use a simulation platform like this to help you test the design roles without having to do expensive engineering. So uh, let's take a look at what that multicellular logic might be. You don't have to put the entire program into one cell type, we mentioned that. Let's have director cells that secrete some kind of a directional signal of where the cargo needs to go. Let's have worker cells that are either attached or unattached. If they're attached, they're gonna look for cargo. I'm sorry, if they're unattached, they're gonna look for cargo. If they're attached, they're gonna to try to deliver their cargo towards the directors. And then the cargo cells just sit there. And if they're unattached, they're gonna secrete a signal that says, hey, I'm available, come pick me up. And if they are attached, then we want them to switch that behavior off and say, stop secreting the, uh, the, the availability signal. And uh, we can then decide where to put the logic of who 
decides when to make the delivery. You either have the, uh, the worker cells decide to drop off the cargo when they reach a signal, or you have the cargo cells say, drop me off here and, um, and, and detach from the worker cells. So you can, you can have some decision of where to put that part of the watch. So let's test it. So here is a uh, simulation model. The green cells are directors. They secrete a chemotactic signal. The blue cells are the cargo, and the red cells are the worker cells. And you can see here a red cell randomly migrating, trying to find the chemotactic signal, uh, finding a blue cell, grabbing on, and now dragging it towards the directors. And when they reach the directors, uh, they're happy, satisfied, they release their cargo, and then they return their, resume their random search looking for more cargo. If you look in the bottom right, you can see that uh, the, as more and more of the cargo are delivered, the chemo the, uh, the delivery signal, I guess, the, uh, the availability signal starts to uh, disappear because these, workers, these uh, worker cells are now running out of cargo to deliver. Uh, this is part of our uh, original business cell method paper. Uh, you can view this simulation online uh, with YouTube, and now actually you can uh, interactively try this model online. Uh, I'd like to point out too that this, this model is included with every physical cell download, so you can try it and play with it, modify it yourself. So with simple cell rules, uh, we can create a multi-set logic that does indeed successfully deliver cargo from some kind of a, a source to some kind of a destination. So could this be loaded with a therapeutic, and could this actually be some kind of a future uh, therapeutic method? And so the idea here is now to replace your director cells with cancer cells. And cancer cells already are creating a director signal, whether they want to or not, because they are secreting, they are sucking up all the oxygen. They are creating depleted regions of oxygen. So oxygen gradients can act like our uh, directional signal, our, our uh, director signal. Cargo cells are before, and then the worker cells uh, are dragging the cargo into the tumor and releasing them into low oxygen regions. And once they release their cargo, they can secrete the therapeutic and start treating the tumor. And uh, at this QR code here, you can try this model yourself, play with the parameter values, change the randomness of the migration, and other thresholds and parameters, and really give it a try. And you can imagine, this is a nice way to kind of say, I know the tumor's around here somewhere, I don't know exactly where, so I'm gonna inject a slurry, a, a mixture of cargo cells and worker cells, and perhaps every now and then you just do another injection and try to keep this thing under control. And that's interesting that emerges as, uh, as a multicellular logic here. Um, you have to think very closely about the randomness of the motion uh, and also the, uh, the delivery threshold, because if you make the threshold too high, eventually you kill off enough tumor cells that the oxygen level re kind of returns closer to normal and the, the cargo cell, the worker cells just don't know when to drop off the cargo. On the other hand, this does help keep the tumor control under a controlled population. The tumor gets bigger, oxygen levels drop again, and you start dropping off more of your therapeutics. So this could be a way to keep a cancer under control. So there's an example of a simple logic uh, built into a multicellular system that could be used to engineer and control a system. <coughs> Excuse me. So as a third example, I'd like to look at using physical cell now in a 3D context to look at cancer immune cell contact dynamics really looking primarily at the physical contact interactions and not at the molecular scale biology. Uh, that can come in, in future work. So as a simple model of uh, a cancer immune model, uh, so I think I'm missing a slide here, so I apologize for that. Uh, let me explain this model a little bit. Here on the left, we start off with that same heterogeneous tumor I showed you earlier on, where yellow cells have more of some kind of a mutant protein or peptide that makes them more responsive to oxygen, which means that they are going to grow a little faster. On the other hand, we know that uh, mutant proteins make weird peptides, and weird peptides can be presented on the surface of a tumor, say through the uh, MHC complex, and present themselves as more immunologic and more attractive targets to, to immune cells. And so that's the model here. Yellow cells, proliferate faster, but are a more attractive immune target. Red cells are immune cells here, and they follow chemotactic gradients towards tumor cells. Whenever they bump into a cell, they test for contact, form an adhesion, test the immunogenicity, and attempt to kill the tumor cell by apoptosis. Now, if they're successful, they will let go and resume their search for more tumor cells. 
And if they're not successful, they will stay here for a certain amount of time and keep trying, either succeed or give up after some amount of time. So here, in this 3D simulation, we found some interesting uh, behavior. And it's in a non-dimensional, or I guess a non-spatial, well-mixed ODE system, we would have expected um, the immune cells to do a much better job of killing off the, the, the yellow cells because they're so much more attractive, they're so much more successful at killing them. But if you add 3D, and if you add stochasticity to the system, uh, you find a completely different behavior, that these red immune cells uh, first end up passing a few of the yellow cells, the very attractive tumor cells, and forming a big clump in the middle of a, of a peak in the chemotractic gradient. This means that they've cleared out a lot of competition, and now the few remaining yellow cells are free to survive and repopulate the tumor, and it's growing worse than ever before. So for a fixed cell population, uh, fixed, uh, say, amount of uh, immune cells, uh, this turns out to not be as effective a therapy as we might hope, at least with these physical contact dynamics. Okay, so this gave us some surprises in 3D, and it was really kind of a fun simulation to, run, to write and run. But one simulation by itself is just a demo. It's not quite science yet. And so we need to at least start exploring the impact of the parameter values. Uh, three parameters we identified as important, saying what's the impact of how stochastic the migration of immune cells is. Now, another parameter that seemed important to us is how quickly can immune cell, or how easy can immune cell form an attachment to a tumor cell, and then how long does that tumor cell, uh, immune cell stay attached before it gives up? You can imagine this is like a, a trade-off in, you know, in economics. The longer an immune cell stays attached, the greater the likelihood it has of killing that tumor cell. On the other hand, the longer it stays attached, uh, the more attractive uh, it may be passing up more attractive targets nearby. And so you want to stay attached long enough to have a good shot at killing the cell, but not so long that you're passing up better opportunities somewhere else. This is an exploration versus exploitation. So suppose now we look at low, medium, high for each of these parameter values. That's um, 27 parameter sets. It's a stochastic model, so we better run 10 replicates per set. Back when we ran the study, it took us about two days to run the full 3D simulation. That's about a year and a half of continuous computing, which is just not feasible. Um, and so to really run the simulation study, we needed high throughput computing. Fortunately, we made great friends at Argonne National Lab and, and Gary Ant in Chicago at the time. And they said, well, let's just run all 270 simulations on a Cray at the same time. So now, uh, over a nice weekend, you can start your simulations, go home, get some dinner, wake up for your Monday morning coffee, and you run your, your entire year and a half of computing in a weekend. And this uh, really gave us some new insights and allowed us to explore this model in, an, in a neat way that we couldn't before and found some surprises and nonlinearities in the model behavior. In particular, uh, the migration bias was very surprising to us. It turned out that we had actually chosen, probably in our initial study, um, in a prototype, the worst possible value for an effective immunotherapy. Uh, that if the tumor cells, had, sorry, if the immune cells had either been more random they would have done a better job because they would have been mixing better with the, with the tumor cells, more like the well-mixed ODE model. And if they had been less random, they would have been done a better job of going from target to target to target and finding things to kill. And having them kind of in the middle of a little bit random actually turned out to be very disadvantageous in this particular therapy. And so this is a kind of a surprise in the model behavior uh, that we could only find through a high throughput investigation. I don't think we could have predicted this a priori just based on intuition. And so that was nice, but we are missing a lot of parameters. There are a lot of things we could have explored in this model. So we thought, well, why not add three more parameters? Uh, one important thing is how long do these immune cells live? What's uh, their apoptosis rate? The longer they live, the more things they could kill. And this kind of is very related to uh, 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 to T-cell exhaustion, because the idea is the same here, of how long does that T-cell stay effective before it can no longer kill things. Another important parameter is the detection threshold. Um, what is the lowest level of the weird mutant protein that tumor cells, I'm sorry, that immune cells can detect and detect them as a target to kill? Now you can imagine that the lower you make that threshold, uh, the better the immune cells ought to be at finding and killing tumor cells. On the other hand, if you make the threshold zero, that means that the immune cells are going to kill everything in sight, and that's going to have horrible, horrible effects. So this is a constraint parameter. And the other parameter is 
once you have a tumor cell, I'm sorry, immune cell attached to a tumor cell, how quickly can you kill the thing? And that ought to be a rate limiting step too. So six parameters, that's a six dimensional design space to consider. It's a constraint space. We already talked about clinical constraints, that if you make the immune cells too sensitive, you're gonna kill not just the tumor cells, but everything in sight, which means that there are limits to our parameter values. It's a constrained optimization problem. Uh, likewise, there are biological constraints. At some point, you're going to run up against biological and physical limits. The immune cell can only kill something so fast before you run up against its limits. A cell can only move so fast. It can only form an adhesion so fast. So there are physical and biological limits. And so you can't just you know, search all of six-dimensional space. You can only search a constrained part of it. Thank goodness, right? Because uh, doing uh, R6 space is really, really intractable. But a constrained space is something we can work on. That said, we don't want to explore this by brute force, and we want to get a better, deeper understanding. So let's start using active learning to help us under, uh, do a better job of our investigation. Uh, this is kind of a step up from that hypercube uh, sampling, which is another way to do this. And so what we want to do is set this problem up and look at six dimensional space and think of it as a binary decision tree classifier problem. Uh, choose some kind of a design scenario. And then classify as true all points that meet your design goal. And classify as false all points that don't meet your design goal. Uh, the scenarios we're going to look at here, uh, let's see, uh, it looks like I missed my slide here that has the scenarios. So I'm going to go back. Um, uh, we're going to have three scenarios that we're going to look at here. The first scenario that we want to look at is uh, can we keep the cancer under control? Do you have no more? tumor cells at the end of your therapy than you had at the start. The next design goal is a little bit more, a therapeutic design goal is a little bit more strict. We want to say, now can we can reduce the tumor cell population by 90%. The next design goal is saying, can we reduce the tumor cell population by 99%? And then to run this, we're going to build this decision tree classifier. And we're going to classify all points in our design spaces, true or false. And uh, then with the high throughput computing, we can run a thousand simulations at a time to help us build this classifier. So what we'll do is we're going to sample 50 points in our six dimensional design space. For each of those 50 points, run 20 replicates, classify the samples as true or false, come up with a consensus, and classify that point in space as meeting or not meeting your design objective. And then the active learning comes in to say that as we run our simulations, we choose them dynamically to help us refine the decision boundary. Instead of just running this thing brute force or using a lab hypercube sampling method, we're going to use the active learning process to guide which simulations we run. Now, the bonus is that because we're building a decision tree, this thing is an interpretable uh, machine model. And we use the Gini coefficients to help us rank the importance of the parameters. We get a little bit more biological learning out of this big investigation. And so, <clears throat> how do we do? Uh, this, these animations on the right show some of the sample designs from the study. Uh, the top left is an, a very successful therapy. The two intermediate ones on the diagonal are moderately successful. And then the, the simulation on the right is completely unsuccessful. And because we were able to do these nested problems, we were really able to explore the topology of our, excuse me, the topology of our design space. Um, if you download the paper here at OSICAL, you'll find that actually, as this entire constrained six-dimensional space we looked at, only about 20% of the designs achieved cancer control. Of those, only about 2% or 8%, you know, a much smaller percent were able to kill 90% of the tumor cells. Uh, a very small percentage, like 2% of the designs, were able to kill 99% of the tumor cells. And then the traditional genetic algorithm to find the optimal were the little tiny points in that tiny 2% of, of your design space. So really being able to explore this, the topology would give us a much better understanding how robust Optima are and, and what kind of a challenging problem we're dealing with in the rapidly decreasing returns of making a stricter and stricter therapeutic design goal. Um, also, uh, combining the HPC with machine learning really made this thing feasible. Um, we were looking at about 10 to seven points in our parameter space, in the six dimensional space, that we wanted to densely sample. By active learning, we only need to run about 30 to 40,000 simulations per ISO contour, which reduced then our simulations by a factor of 10 to the three. Well, so we were able to cut by about a factor of 1,000 how many simulations we had to run to really thoroughly explore this design space. 
that really made it feasible to do multiple contours in a design space rather than just all or nothing do one genetic algorithm to optimize. So after about 40,000 core hours, you can find a, a surface, a nice surface in this design space, uh, which is like half a day on a cray, probably a little faster if you were using even more compute nodes, because we didn't really run that many simulations at a time. So it really it helps to do science. Also, because we couple this with an interpretable machine model, we are able to get more human learning from machine learning. Uh, one thing I find quite fascinating about this work is that uh, there is no molecular, no molecular biology in this model right now. It's purely based upon the physical contact dynamics. And yet, we got some very nice insight of it. The top two parameters by the Gini coefficients were the immune cell lifetime. And the longer the immune cells live, the more effective the therapy. That was the single most important parameter in this model's behavior. And if you look out there in T cell and immunotherapy research topics right now, one of the most important things people are looking at is T cell exhaustion. How long do those immune cells stay effective? So it's very interesting that purely based on contact counts, we can come up with the same top problem in immunotherapy. The other next most important one is just tuning the detection threshold of the tumor cells, making them more sensitive, making them more successful. And so this suggests that uh, a limiting factor in the effective therapies is finding more specific uh, homing of immune cells so you can detect, so you can make the detection threshold more sensitive uh, and still escape those clinical constraints. If you can move the clinical constraints, you're going to be doing a better job of immunotherapy. So machine learning helps us to interpret the agent-based model results and get some new biological insights. And we'll definitely suggest, I think, our follow-up studies. Now, just to kind of give a brief note on ongoing technical work in physicel, uh, we're working now on simplifying the way we specify models. Uh, we've already introduced uh, XML-based configuration files, uh, user-defined parameters in XML, and uh, an XML-based microenvironment setup instead of doing a complex API. Uh, in the future, we're going to support SPML, System Biology Markup Language, to help uh, specify the, mo the molecular scale models. And we're also testing other specifications, like how to do the basic cell definitions purely in XML. And this will really help, I think, our modelers to create new, new work. Uh, we're also working on adding missing features like uh, cell differentiation, stem cell states, cell polarization, and uh, tissue mechanics. And we're also working very closely with the Barcelona Supercomputing Center and uh, University of Delaware to uh, improve the computational efficiency of the platform. So this is really exciting and, and I think uh, just a tremendous strength of the open source approach to science. That uh, we don't have to do this alone. We can work with really fantastic people all over the world uh, and share that, those improvements with everybody. So I talked a lot so far about Physicel, the simulation framework, uh, some examples that use Physicel, and how we use high throughput computing machine learning to improve, to kind of increase the firepower of the science we can get from the simulation platform. I'd like to kind of close out today's discussion with turning from the software to the community, and that we want to turn this into an, a true software ecosystem that's community driven. And so, to do that, we certainly need the core framework, which we just talked about. We need to be able to run simulations high throughput, but you also need to be able to share models and code with other people. You need to be able to train the community. You need to be able to accept community contributions uh, that not just improve the core framework, but make the framework more helpful through extensions and utilities and tools. Uh, so let's talk briefly about model outreach and sharing. Um, just kind of Going back in my history, when I was a PhD student, sharing a model meant that you wrote a paper and you wrote down all the equations. And then people could implement the equations themselves and you wrote your algorithm and, hey, you shared your model. That's uh, not reproducible, not repeatable without basically hiring a postdoc. Um, sometimes people would share code, but if they did, it was like pre-open source and it was uh, sharing with conditions. It's like, sure, you can use my code if you make me an author on every paper you ever write from the rest of history. Kind of large strings attached. Uh, when I was early faculty, things had finally improved a little. Uh, people were finally open sourcing. They were using more standard uh, licenses like BSD or MIT or GPL. Uh, they were, you know, they usually post the code on their website or as a big zip file of their supplementary material. Uh, sometimes they use repositories like SourceForge, but it was still kind of not great, right? It was usually undocumented, usually completely unreproducible, completely ununderstandable. And now people are at least are using things like GitHub to share repositories. 
uh, usually forming uh, snapshots, uh, which is a good thing. And uh, it, but it's still cumbersome. You know, you still have to download and clone the GitHub repository. You still have to track on all the dependencies, prepare your development environment, successfully compile. That's already a big barrier for many people. Learn the syntax and run the model. Learn how to load and visualize results. There's a lot going on to actually successfully use and repeat somebody else's code. And then the result is that many shared codes are never used. And so one thing we did is we uh, kind of went back to the drawing board and said, well, let's try to do this in the cloud. So we worked with some very talented undergraduates and graduates in my lab and built a, a Python script that will read the XML configuration file of any physics cell model, generate Jupyter widgets and help you create a Jupyter notebook that's that, that works as a graphical user interface. And then we can cloud host that model on NanoHub to make a cloud hosted user reactive model. So now, uh, you can go to this website, say go to NanoHub, click on the model, run it right there in the browser. It will connect through and to backend compute resources and upload the data right back into the Jupyter Notebook so you can actually visualize and play and interact with your model as it's going. No compiling, no downloading, no reading documentation. Just click and run and try the thing out. We've even uh, used this for sharing it with broad audiences, including biologists and other collaborators. You can say, hey, try our model out. Do you, what do you think? Uh, and they say, well, that looks right, but that doesn't match what I see. I think the assumptions need to be changed. And so you can actually close the loop and collaborate faster with your multidisciplinary collaborators. So a great use case now is to create a try this model yourself. You need to make a little QR code, put the barcode in your talk, and let people try your models. Uh, you can integrate documentation and uh, in information on your model. You can really explain all your parameter values and visualize it right there. And one uh, useful use case now is we include a user interactive version of our models for poster presentations, for talks, for presentations. Um, we also now include publication companion apps in, every, in the method section of every paper we write so that reviewers uh, first and then later on the paper readers have a chance to dynamically interact with your model and understand what it is that's behind the results you're presenting. We think that should be standard practice and we wanna make that easy for people to do with our platform. So now we want to move towards community. And so uh, thanks to, uh, with help from the National Cancer Institute, we have some supplemental funding and we're doing a year of business cell. Uh, this past winter and this continuing the spring, we've been creating new training materials that are interactive. We're creating uh, educational micro apps to illustrate key parts of the business cell modeling platform, motility, secretion, cell cycling, custom parameters uh, that you can kind of explore and run to help you kind of understand this modeling platform and learn to use it more efficiently. Uh, later this year, we're going to have a funded hackathon where people can come and either propose to build, say, utility or uh, you know, improve the core library or uh, add new capabilities. And then we will have funding for two six-week visitors to come here and do long-term projects. So we're really, really excited about this. This is a really big focus in my lab right now uh, to, to really make this a, a platform that's not just code sitting out there, but something that's well documented, something that people can train and learn to use and then contribute back as a true community. And so those training materials, uh, they're going to be a combination of uh, cloud hosted you know, training apps, PowerPoint slides and recordings. Uh, we will put this all up on our new website, physicelcell.org, uh, and have some blog entries. We, we can't uh, wait to, for you to try this stuff out. So we'll be keeping an eye out for it. We'll be available in the next weeks. And on top of that, we want a tool ecosystem, not just business cell, the core engine, but things to go on the front and the back end of a research pipeline. Can you make it easier to configure a model? Once the model is done, can you visualize the results? Can you load the data? Can you post process it? Uh, can you make it easier for people to make Jupyter notebooks? And so we're creating a, a GitHub organization to start collecting some official supported tools to make this a, a true ecosystem. And here's what we're really looking for contributions for visualization, data analysis and model configuration to really make it easier to create, use, and understand and uh, analyze models. And to the extent that we can, we'd like to support standards so you can use these tools for other, other model frameworks as well and get towards reproducibility. And then down the road, we want to make it possible to make plugins. So we're working on now on a clear API to start contributing things like, uh, say, a library of immune cell types, or support for Boolean network models, or support for systems of ODEs. And it's going to require clean documentation and protocols uh, and ways to credit people who contribute these things when these components get used. 
but something that's a work of process, progress, and we would love some, uh, some, some input on how to do that well. <clears throat> so an early example, we were just thrilled to work with uh, Gail uh, and others at Institute Curie, who have found our preprint, and then they found our GitHub repository and talked with us and said, hey, we have Mopos for building signaling networks. You have Physicel for multicellular simulations. Let's put them together and create Physiboss. And so that was the very first community contribution to Physicel. We're really, really excited about it. And now we're working to generalize and uh, make this a bit more robust so that this can be updated in the future. And so that, I hope, is the first of many plugins and extensions that really make this a truly extensible multi-scale platform for multi-cellular systems biology. So thank you very much for, for joining us for the talk. Uh, please visit physicel.org to, to find the code uh, or visit, feel, follow us on Twitter at physicel uh, to see the latest. And if you download these slides later, uh, you can get all sorts of references to find uh, further materials. So. Um, I think if the organizers are, are keen on it, I'm, I'm very happy to open this up to questions. Oh, um, thank you very much, Paul. It was a really nice and interesting presentation. So now it's time for a question. Do you have any question? Mm, I'm asking to the, all the attendees. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, so uh, right now we, uh, I don't see any question, but I have a couple for myself. Um, so, uh, starting from uh, the first example that uh, you gave us, uh, can you use those prediction uh, real time by clinicians? I mean, sorry, uh, can clinicians use your those prediction real time in any way? That's that's a really good question. That's actually a project we're working on right now. We have uh, started a consortium with the Department of Energy and the National Cancer Institute, uh, industrial partners like IBM, uh, more academic partners like uh, Stanford, and we're actually trying to now create a coalition to create digital twins for uh, cancer predictions. And their idea is that you would uh, calibrate to individual patient data and continue to calibrate uh, individual patient simulations um, eruptions on a high performance computer and start looking through those treatment options with the patient to say, what is the best for you? What meets your constraints? I think this cell will be a part of that model system, not the only part of the model system, but that's something the community is starting to build right now and we're very excited to, be, to help lead that. Uh, on smaller scales, uh, yes, you could do that for targeted things. Um, I think, you know, when we get to the reality of uh, getting through FDA, it's going to be really interesting to get these things approved for clinical care. That is a long-term goal, uh, but it's going to take a lot of work. Um, and so right now, I think we're more focused on biological discovery. The things you can do without FDA approval are things like provide research tools for basic science to help accelerate the discovery process for testing and screening hypotheses and treatment ideas. And you could also use them for kind of uh, pre-screening uh, treatment protocols against virtual cohorts and virtual populations kind of say for a population like this what co what strategy works well to say uh, reduce selection uh, to postpone selection for a resistant clone to reduce resistance and this would be a great way to test strategies that can lead to better clinical trials uh, that would probably be a bit easier to get through clinical approval but down the road we absolutely envision using these for patient tailored predictions and that's something we've been working towards a long time uh, and again, in a variety of ways, ranging from improving the basic science to improving the basic strategies and protocols that clinicians are going to use to help educate clinicians, and then down the road for actual patient tailored uh, uh, simulations, which are going to really require merging a whole lot of technologies, including this cell. <coughs> Excuse oh, me. Right. Oh, okay. Right. Thank you. Um, I have a question from, uh, from Julia Chiari. Uh, she asked, I find this software really useful and it's improving really challenging. I would like to ask if at now, is it possible to simulate also liquid tumors? And if not, do you plan to extend the simulation abilities of your software to this task? Oh, huh, that's a really great question. So the interesting thing about liquid tumors is um, for a lot of these, you don't care so much about um, the spatial aspects or the mechanical aspects. And what that means is you could turn off the diffusion and you could turn off uh, a lot of the mechanics and, and really accelerate the simulation. 
And so if that is possible, uh, that's something we have not yet done, but I think it'd be a very straightforward modification. And with, with turning off targeted parts of the codes, I think we could even ramp them up to bigger cell numbers and, and really do some interesting things. It's basically turning into a well-mixed model. Um, and uh, if you're interested, we'd be very happy to have a call with you and to help you set that up. Because that's something we've been interested to try. We just ourselves haven't had that problem yet. Uh, but very feasible. And I think it'd be really fast. Okay. Right. I hope this uh, your answer uh, answered the question of Julia. Uh, I have um, another question from myself again. Um, so you uh, want to improve FisiCell platform. Is any kind of help uh, that the scientific community, such as clinicians or others, can provide you in terms of contribution, let's say data or anything else? Absolutely. You know, first of all, the digital twin uh, community is is looking for that uh, as we start looking for the right model problem to to test this idea out on. Uh, but also, I mean, this is something that we do in our everyday work. Uh, we we work with a variety of clinicians, mostly with basic biology, but also clinicians, uh, and they help us. They can help us in a, in a great variety of ways. You know, first of all, just talking with clinicians and biologists helps us understand what are the real problems and questions of cancer biology. And so having these conversations is really important to kind of make sure we don't hide in engineering land, but find the right problems, the important problems to work on. And on the other hand, the, you know, the physical science perspective that we as mathematicians and engineers bring can really help uh, steer those conversations to new ways and open up new ideas for problems that maybe not have, might not have been thought of in traditional uh, ways. So that's one level of interaction where clinicians and biologists can really help us. The next one is just, the insights, the domain expertise. What do you see tumor cells do? What do you see T cells do? What is a CAR T cell? I mean, you know, explain this thing to me, right? You know, what makes the difference between a cancer-associated fibroblast from a normal fibroblast? These observations, this domain knowledge is the result of collectively thousands of year, human years of learning. And no machine can just, replicate all of human knowledge from raw data, not, not by brute force, and it's foolish to do so. And so these kinds of conversations of learning what cells do for us become our model hypotheses and our rules. And there's no other way to get that other than talking with biologists, talking with clinicians, looking under microscopes, reading papers, and getting that, that knowledge, that intuition of what needs to go into a model. What can you put in? What can't you put in? And I think that's some of the most critical stuff we can get. Then of course the data, growth rates, birth rates, death rates, motility. Uh, one thing we've been working with and talking with, uh, you know, I find that uh, the standardization of how to characterize cell motility is not as great as we would like. Uh, the multimod communities work very hard on that. Um, and I think just learning what we need to measure for cell motility and then getting good consistent measurements would be really, really helpful. Uh, learning what it's secreted factors, you know, so metabolomics is now starting to get there, metabolomics, uh, proteomics, you know, so we're getting a lot of omics that's helping. Uh, positional data, super, super helpful. Uh, I think one of the most important things that we can get that we don't have much of yet is longitudinal data. What we often have in uh, problems right now is we have a whole lot of patients sampled at one or two time points rather than a few patients sampled at many time points to get you the growth dynamics. But it's the dynamical parameters that we really need. And those, I think, are where we can really use some great help for clinicians and biologists uh, to help us design novel experiments to capture these things. And that's improving all the time. And odds are, if you can think to measure something, there's some clever you know, engineer or biologist uh, or clinician who knows how to capture it. And so I think just getting more and more conversation on what can we measure? What can't we measure? And just writing it all down would be a really fantastic step. Right. Uh, thank you. I, I really agree with you. And hopefully your presentation today will open new conversation and a new collaboration abroad. Uh, we have uh, one question from, um, uh, from Fatima. So I will uh, give them the micro to him. Okay. Uh, 
Hello, uh, many thanks, Professor, for giving us uh, such a great lecture. And um, actually, uh, I, I am working some kind of uh, research similar to you, but uh, we use some uh, software uh, like Comsol, and um, also I added some code to it to somehow um, adding some metabolism and modeling of some metabolism inside the cells. Uh, so I just wondering uh, how do you model all these things in many um, different levels? Because uh, when I add the my code to the console uh, and add, for example, subcellular uh, level simulation to the um, extracellular level and, and then adding some um, flow and sub, uh, blah, blah things to that, it's going to um, you know, kill <laughs> our system and it takes lots of time and also um, I cannot even uh, model the for example moving cells or such um, uh, uh, some kind of things because I, I also did some uh, experimental research on that so can you please explain us how uh, you did this well that's a great question so part of it gets down to uh, resolution uh, what level of detail uh, in our agent-based model, we're modeling cell position and cell volume, but not cell morphology, which means we know where they are, we know how big we are, they are, we just don't know uh, what their shape is, which simplifies the model quite a bit. We have them interact with potential functions, which are very, very fast. Uh, later on, you know, for some models, we need a little bit more fancy mechanics so that we can add things like hooking and springs, not too much of a problem. Um, and so that can be parallelized very, very nicely with OpenMP to spread the work over many compute nodes. And then you can read, uh, Barcelona's been doing this now, and can say, no, that parallelizes on one compute node. Now you can connect many compute nodes together with MPI, message passing interface, and that makes it even faster. And so uh, for us, choosing a level of detail that let us uh, do many cells and some mechanics, uh, but was not super high resolution, allowed us to get the cell count up and to make it more efficient and fast. Then adding molecular scale effects for us is a matter of adding uh, either systems of Boolean uh, networks or adding uh, ODE solvers. And then here, this is a, a work we're working on quite a bit right now. Uh, our design goal is to run systems of 40 to 50 ordinary differential equations and systems of 10 to the 4 to 10 to the 5 agents. And so we, we have to parallelize. And we have to make use of fast open source libraries that are already out there. And so right now, um, the fastest open source library I have seen for big systems of biological ordinary differential equations written as SBML, System Biology Markup Language, is Live Road Runner. And so we're very lucky that one of the Live Road Runner uh, developers is right here in our department, just down the hall from us. And so we're working to couple those codes together to put a copy of Live Road Runner in each individual cell like Roadrunner itself is parallelized, and they give you a big open MP loop around it and just parallelize the whole thing. But that's a work in progress, but it's promising so far. So part of it is just, you know, picking the level of detail that's appropriate to scale to many cells um, and, and parallelizing as well as you can. Comsol is a really neat package, although of course I'm not keen on it being closed source, um, but it's designed for things like finite element models and really high resolution. So I would use Comsol for things like modeling one cell with like cytoskeleton uh, in super, super high resolution. Uh, and then, you know, layer on top of that, you know, a bunch of ODEs. Or if you really care about the localization proteins, then you have a bunch of PDEs, but that's, that's really, really expensive. So you have to be, you know, step back and say, do I really need this resolution, you know, this level of detail? And if not, then, then step back and, and pick a, a more tractable approach. And that's that's what we've done for our particular problems. Now, there are some problems where, where resolution matters. And then I'd say the approaches that are doing things like um, parallelizing cellular POTS models are working very nicely. And there's a wonderful group in Germany who's doing that right now. Like, uh, I'll have to circle back and remember their names and, and give them the links. They gave a wonderful talk at ISCHPC last year um, on their work. And it's just, it's absolutely beautiful. Um, so I have to dig up their information and, and paste that in because it's great work. Uh, and it really just comes down to what level of detail you need for your particular problem. Um, and, you know, to the extent that you can get away with diffusion equations and parallelizing, that's the other side. Um, we knew that for most biological problems, we're mostly looking at diffusion uh, problems 
with sources and sinks, uh, segregate cells. And so we worked on really optimizing that specific class of PDEs rather than writing a generic PDE solver that works for everything pretty well. That lets you get away with all things. You can vectorize the equations. You can vectorize the operators. You can vectorize the solvers, uh, our diffusion solvers. We knew we were doing a family of diffusion equations. And so what we could do is we could come up with a vectorized Thomas solver that would solve uh, apply the operator on the entire vector of equations simultaneously. And that made a big, big difference. You're getting single instruction, multiple data optimizations off of that. Um, then on top of that, um, we use operator splitting. So we turned the 3D problem to three 1D problems. Now they're all uh, tridiagonal systems, which means you can use Thomas. Uh, the other thing is if your diffusion coefficients don't change in time, um, then you can pre-compute and store the forward sweep of your Thomas algorithm, so you only have to do back substitution. So it's even faster yet. And so we use every trick we could to, to capitalize on what we knew about our specific system and say, you know, diffusion uh, constant coefficients is good enough for 90% of the problems. Let's start with those, and then we can generalize later. And that's, you know, so that's also been quite helpful for us. But Thomas is a really much. powerful package, but uh, yeah. it, it's for a specific yeah. problem. Yeah, console is uh, actually great, but uh, you know because we need to uh, simulate some kind of uh, fluid dynamic as well. So uh, getting all these things together is gonna be super huge. Yeah. So can I email you in private when I have question, if it's possible, especially about this SBML code? Uh, well, we. Uh... If you'd like to follow up later, I'd be happy to work together and, and point you to our progress and collaborate on that. I'd be, be delighted to share it. And uh, we envision within the next year that um, this SPML support will be standard in Business Cell. Um, but if you want earlier access to help us test it, uh, we can make that work. We can make that happen. That would be very great. So I will contact you through email. Thank you. Oh, we'd be delighted. That'd be fantastic. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Fatima. Uh, we have another question from uh, Ani Amar. And the question is, what is the stage of your cell differentiation or what are the stage of your stem cell simulations? And uh, what is the level of physiological details you're going to include there? So we've, we've done some testing on stem cells. We're actually working, collaborating with some uh, mathematicians at uh, UC Irvine who want to model stem cell differentiation. Um, on the face, it's actually very simple because you can do multiple cell definitions in business cell. I think you can always make uh, custom rules to say when you change from cell definition one to cell definition two, which would be a differentiation process. Uh, so that's something we can do. We've also tested adding as a more standard feature, adding uh, stem cell status or differentiation state as a part of the standard cell phenotype. So uh, one thing I should have brought up in some business cell We've implemented a lot of the basic processes like cell cycling, cell division, motility, apoptosis, necrosis, secretion uptake. All these things are like implemented in a standard way, which means uh, that we want a paradigm where users are not worrying about re-implementing a cell cycle, say, oh, I have to make the volume increase, I have to make the cell divide, I have to place the daughter cells and do all of this work. And basically everyone's doing the same thing over and over again, slightly differently, not consistently. He said, we'll take care of that. Uh, you focus on programming the phenotype. And so you set the division rate, the division time scales, the apoptosis rates, things like that. We'll take, so you tell us when to trigger a process and then we'll do the process. Now we want to add differentiation to that. And so we actually came up with a, basically a nice graph structure to represent uh, differentiation networks. We've been hesitant to roll that into business cell yet because we find that there is not yet good consensus in the stem cell community to say, is there like a canonical representation of stem cells and differentiation? Is it a network of discrete states? Is it a one-dimensional network? Is it you know, a two-directional network where things can de-differentiate? Uh, is it really discrete states or is it like a continuum variable of stemness? And so, without a really good consensus of what the right thing is to do. We haven't really put it to standard business cell just yet, but we do have tests. And again, if you have some ideas on what ought to be the canonical representation, we would really, really love to talk, because that's something I'd love to nail down and just roll out. 
Uh, but in the meantime, we'd be very happy to open up test codes to you uh, or to collaborate and, and show you what we have done so far. Oh, thank you very much, Paul. I hope this uh, answer to all the questions of our attendees. And at the moment, so we are not, we don't have any other question. Thank you very much for attending the webinar, and thank you very much, Paul, again for uh, your really, really interesting presentation. Thanks very much, and please uh, give us a look to get the slides and uh, get in touch if you'd like to. We'd, we'd love to talk with you. Sure. Bye, Paul. Thanks. Bye.